Hi, Charlie Walker. How are you today? I'm great, Brian. How are you? I'm doing great, thanks. So, you know, I'm very happy to have you here today. We're going to talk some about, about um, how you decided to become an astronaut, and you are the first commercial astronaut, and we're, we're so happy to have you as, a, as an advisor to Soul Star. Um, you're, you're a legend, so uh, thanks, for, thanks for talking today. Oh, it's, it's uh, my great pleasure, and uh, it's certainly a rewarding uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, opportunity for me to, to uh, speak with you today, be part of the, uh, the program in this way. So excellent. So I'm going to read a little bit of your background, and Charlie actually flew, flew on the space shuttle three times in that, um, in that time period, and I want to talk to you about those flights, and I know that you were on space shuttle missions 41D, 51D, and 61B, and you accumulated 20 days of experience in space and flew 8.2 million miles. That is just, that's just incredible. Um, and I didn't get frequent flyer miles, shucks. <laughs> oh man, I hate when that <laughs> happens. Oh well. And so I'd like to talk to you about uh, how you communicated to the Earth while you're up there, because as you know, so that's what Solstar does, is that we're trying to make it very, we're not trying, we are. We actually have tested it three times in space and it's worked. And so we basically, our idea is to make it, make it really easy, make it simple for people in space to communicate with the ground through the internet, basically, the regular, you know, regular phone call, basically, to where you can call, um, you can call the Earth. You can call my cell phone with our technology, for instance, or your your wife's cell phone, or uh, use your laptop to to be on the internet, basically. And and as vice versa, people could contact you. So, could you spend just a describe about how how um, the communications were with with you while you're doing your work there, and as um, as well as now, if you could, if you would have had Solstar's communications technologies while you were up there, that would be great to hear, hear your, you talk about that some. When I was flying early in the space shuttle program, um, well, my very first flight, there was not yet an operational um, uh, relay satellite in geosync, uh, geosynchronous orbit above us, above our orbit. So we were limited to uh, direct communication to receiving stations on the ground. And uh, there were periods of maybe uh, as much as, uh, often less than, uh, five, six minutes of um, continuous radio contact, uh, uh, RF, that's bo bo both for both voice and for data, contact with uh, the ground and consequently mission control and my people who were in a back room and in back of Mission Control Center, uh, listening to my specific comments when I had a chance to give them. But because um, there were only something like, depending on the orbit, of course, anywhere from two to, to uh, maybe five, six uh, episodes every 90 minutes, every 90 minute orbit of radio contact with the ground for a few minutes each time, there was great demand, of course, uh, and prioritization was necessary as to what was transmitted, what took up the bandwidth and the time, and I was last on the totem pole. Right. And um, so uh, I actually got very little time with the ground, I mean, uh, tens of seconds. So you had to be very succinct in terms of what you were saying and, uh, and how long uh, it took you to say it. I did have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to have uh, recordings of lengthy reports, uh, uh, minutes to 10 minutes or more, at the end of the day, and then while the crew slept, and of course the spacecraft was still orbiting the Earth and going over receiving stations, uh, the recorders were dumped to the ground, and so my people uh, at o dark 30 uh, uh, crew time and on the ground, they could listen to my recordings and get a a post facto hours after my experiences and whatever I was transmitting to them had actually happened, but, but to get a report and a status. So that was the way I operated for my first, second, and by the time my third flight happened um, uh, in late uh, 1985, 
there was uh, uh, two, two operating TDRA satellites, and so we had uh, uh, more time to communicate with the ground and relay, but still um, uh, the bandwidth was uh, relatively low and the opportunity again was prioritized, and so I had uh, not that much time to, for real-time communication with the ground. And so what I found, and I had problems with my equipment, both my equipment, the hardware, I had to replace some hardware, which I did have a few spares on board, unfortunately the right spares. And I had to do on my first flight a, a software reprogramming to overcome a bug that we hadn't noticed in our, uh, in our experiments uh, uh, program software. And uh, it would have helped me tremendously in terms of the, the time. Now, let me back up to say, of course, a space mission uh, on shuttle was limited in amount of time that you had on orbit. And so you, you maximized everything that, uh, that you needed to do uh, uh, into that time. You put that into that time, prioritized what time you spent at this task or that task. And um, that's all you had. And so the most you could do in the least amount of time and the most help you had was extremely important. And the, the help that I had was just what was in my procedures written in front of me that I had, I had written, but with the help of lots of the, uh, the brainy engineers and, and biologists uh, behind my experimental, my R&D work uh, on the ground and pre-flight. But I was limited with that for the most part. So um, the problems I encountered, I really had to overcome them myself, and I, I managed to get uh, to virtually all of them done satisfactorily. But uh, if I had radio contact with the ground, either voice and or voice and data, we could have gone through that a lot more expeditiously and without a couple of, oh gosh, I should have done this the first time. Well, I better back up and do it this way uh, to get it right might have avoided that and been much more efficient in the use of that valuable, counted in the hundreds of thousands of dollars a minute uh, in orbit time. So uh, those were things both uh, uh, talking to the brainy people that uh, were on the ground uh, is a, got to be a very valuable uh, uh, asset to, uh, to have that communications uh, uh, channel the bandwidth uh, and uh, the uh, uninterrupted flow of uh, both voice and data will be incredibly useful. I, the, the analogy that I, that I try to use, Brian, is if someone is in a laboratory, a science lab, or an engineering uh, development facility here on Earth, just imagine if you are that person, imagine you've got to do your job in terms of scientific investigation, experiment, um, uh, redo the experiment to get it uh, to attempt to get it right and to get a positive result or hardware development how imagine how difficult it is to do that if you're in the room that's two rooms down and you've only got a little voice link and only every so often with that equipment and your experiment uh, but if you're right there with it which you could be virtually there with it with broadband uh, internet uh, uh, accessed uh, communications to your uh, between your uh, research yourself your work in space and uh, and yourself and your people on the ground that's uh, it's a virtual laboratory experience that you've got to try to replicate and the soul star systems give you the opportunity to do that Yes, well, that was a fantastic description, and it shows the problem that we're solving with our communications technology. And we do believe that SolarStar's communications services will revolutionize the way that space research is conducted, just for those reasons that you said, because we have to, um, the scientists on the ground too, right, to be able to interact with their machines or experiments in space very conveniently 24-7. And if they're lucky enough to have people on board as well, then that's what you just pointed out is the whole reason why we're doing this is you have to have, you have to be able to replicate that laboratory, make it as, as uh, close as possible to what you have on the ground. Make it as close as possible to you being there with your work if, that, if you're not in fact there with your work. And even if you are, Two heads, 10 heads are better than one. And so being able to communicate with those other people 
is absolutely uh, uh, essential to the best uh, outcomes that uh, you want to achieve. To show you all these systems to make a, a rocket. Um, Multiple systems successful. and the training and preparation for uh, the execution of all those systems at the right time, in the right order, and to the right degree uh, is, is very valuable. And so information flow, uh, even just a, uh, a single zap, electron zap as a command uh, is critical to make sure that it happens and it happens at the right time and at the right intensity to, uh, to do its, its job of executing whatever it is. And so communications, data and information flow, absolutely critical in all things that uh, we want to do and um, are trying to do. And the more bandwidth, the more secure and stable and continuous communications that we have between those of us that remain on the ground and those that uh, go out there and the systems that, uh, that uh, we send out there with them, all of that is absolutely critical uh, in terms of the communication channels that we have. Well, well thanks for that, Charlie. It, uh, of course, means so much when a, uh, an astronaut tells us those things of how our, the Sol Star communications technology can, can be very useful for, for commercial and, and government spaceflight as we move forward. And, uh, just excellent, excellent examples. We're so, we're so. Um, I speak for a lot of people that we thank you for you know having having the courage and the um, and the the vision to 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 let McDonald Douglas know that you wanted to fly and that you were able to fly with NASA, and and I hope that you had the chance to fly again so that you will so that you can test out the and use the Solstar communications equipment and uh, we'll definitely give you the, we'll give you the astronaut discount, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. I, I look forward to, uh, to, to an opportunity to do just that and, uh, and execute whatever uh, uh, tasks I might be given in order to do that, but also to renew my, uh, my recharge my overview effect uh, uh, and uh, the, relate with a little more maturity perhaps, but uh, relate right. once again, the opportunity, the, the opportunity to look out the window, to feel that unique environment in a, uh, in a, from inside a human body, right. a unique perspective that uh, more people should have. I think it would, uh, it would be a much, uh, uh, an advantageous and very beneficial experience for a lot more human beings to have. But uh, for Solstar to be able to help and encourage uh, that along in uh, terms of our economy, in terms of entrepreneurs, in terms of, of technical uh, and, and even uh, societal advancement, Solstar is, uh, is there to do that mission. Uh, and I am uh, very proud to, to, uh, to be offered the opportunity to be a part of the team to do that. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, go Solstar. Right on.